Hello, friends and neighbors, and welcome to the latest edition of the Gifts for Boy podcast. Last episode, we took a deep dive into cuties and the statement that this film, uh, the, the fact that this film is available on a mainstream service, what statement is that actually making about our society? If you haven't already, please check it out, and uh, for that and any other episode, I would love your feedback. Uh, let me know what you think about this edition and any other by emailing me, Dave, at giftsforglory.com. Dave at gifts, the number four, glory.com. We'd love to hear from you. And as we get started, I am thrilled to announce that my wife, Bobby, and I, we're heading to camp. Uh, the pandemic and everything surrounding it pushed uh, this camp from July to October. Uh, but Bobby and I are going next month in just a few weeks to serve at Royal Family Kids Camp. And if you haven't heard of Royal Family Kids Camp, RFK is looking to break the cycle of neglect, abuse, and abandonment of children who are in the foster care system. Uh, through RFK, they fulfill their mission by providing an array of programs, all directed toward changing the trajectory of young lives, which usually include a combination of academic failure, drug abuse, uh, teen pregnancy, sex trafficking, homelessness, and incarceration. And so we want to be part of this mission to help prevent further downward spirals for these kids and give them a weekend where they're treated like royalty and we're really excited to be a part of that so in october bobby and i are serving as camp counselors and we need your help part of our pledge to serve is a pledge to help raise funds for the camp to make sure that these camps can have a as we pray a life-changing experience there are two ways that you can help us uh, if you're in the Chicagoland area, we are taking orders for some homemade fudge. Bobby's Famous Fudge is on sale now, and uh, you can find our Facebook page at Bobby's Famous Fudge, all one word, Bobby's Famous Fudge, and we'll deliver to you here in the Chicagoland area. We're, we aren't able to ship yet, uh, so if you're outside Chicago, you could buy for somebody else that's here in Chicagoland. But if you would like to just give us a hand and help us in raising funds for Royal Family Kids Camp, uh, we are taking donations as part of our fundraising. Uh, you can send something to us, send us a gift, large, small, whatever you, is on your heart. Uh, you can send it to us via PayPal or Zelle. And you send those gifts to bcgrad2004 at hotmail.com. bcgrad two zero zero four at hotmail.com uh bcgrad2004 at hotmail.com uh our goal is to raise 700 uh which is 350 each and we'd love and we'd be humbled uh really humbled and really appreciative by any support you can get if uh you're in chicago and you'd love to buy some fudge or if you'd like to just uh, uh help us out with a, a a small large medium gift whatever you can we would truly would be appreciative and we would go and, and represent uh everybody that helps support us in uh, serving these kids coming up in October. Uh, you can find some more details in the show notes, or uh, you can find it po- in various posts on the Gifts for Glory Facebook page. Uh, so uh, if you're uh, willing and able, uh, we'd love uh, your support in making sure that, that this camp can be a memorable experience for every one of these amazing kids. Now let's dive into the Devotions with Dave segment. I'm going to be reading from Isaiah 40, uh, verses 28 to 31. Uh, Starting in verse 28. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depth of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Chapter 40 of Isaiah is one of hope. Not necessarily immediate hope to the people of Isaiah's day, but the coming hope, the hope of the freedom after the Israelites' captivity, hope of the coming Messiah, hope of the new heavens and earth. Now God has a plan. This chapter is celebrating the beauty, the majesty, the power, might, wisdom, and strength of our God. In verses 28 to 31, we see how we can draw hope, which breeds strength and rejuvenation and power for what we face. Verse 31, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. We cannot do this on our own. 
This life is full of challenges, and Lord knows we are seeing so many challenges in our interpersonal relationships in the world today. Uh, just scrolling through Facebook, th- scrolling through Twitter, you see so much angst and so much anger, so much divisiveness. And it's hard to combat it all. And it's impossible to deal with it on your own. That's why God is there. That's why God gives us the Holy Spirit. And that's why when we trust in Him, we can soar on those wings like eagles. We can run and not grow weary. But we have to trust in the Lord. And we have to draw near to Him, plug into His Holy Spirit, and allow His strength to be our strength. His might to be our might. And let His awesome power be glorified in our weakness. So take some time, spend time in the Word, uh, spend time in the book, not in the Facebook, but in His book. And I would challenge you, and I, I've challenged you before on, on some of these Devotions with Dave segments, grab a real physical Bible with real paper and pages and binding and set your phone aside. Because yeah, it's great to have the, the Bible apps, the Bible reading apps, the Bible study apps on your phone. But your phone is still connected to the internet, and your phone will still show notifications and text messages and and the last like of a tweet or the last comment on Facebook. So it's easier to get distracted if you're studying the Bible on your phone. So put your phone down, grab the real Bible, flip through the pages. There's something more authentic and something more majestic about reading words on an actual page. Because... It's the real physical Bible. So spend time in your real physical Bible. Spend time with the real Lord. And let's draw strength from Him so that we can run this race and not grow weary. And let's trust in Him that no matter what happens on Facebook, no matter what happens on the news, no matter what happens on Twitter, we have a God that is sovereign. We have a God that loves us. We have a God that sent His Holy Spirit to help us get through these times. And only just to survive, but to thrive and to have life abundantly. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're all going to be rich. But we can have life abundantly in God's presence and in His Spirit. And it shouldn't be just us. We need to be bringing people aboard the life raft that is Jesus Christ as much as possible. We need to tell them that there is a life raft and there's a need to get on that life raft. And we need to do it quickly because our time on earth is limited. And depending on what you're seeing or what you believe, we could be getting so close to the second coming of Christ. So there's an urgency to get as many people aboard the life raft before this Titanic sinks. So I just want to leave you that encouragement and also the hope that when we trust in God he'll give us the strength and the power to achieve so many amazing things and it's all for his glory so uh, that was our devotions with Dave segment and we're reading from Isaiah chapter 40 verses 28 to 31 but uh, all of 40 is just an amazing read Uh, so spend some time in your word and spend some time with God uh, let's get on to our interview. We had a really fun conversation with uh, our guest. His name is Tyler Smith. He's a pastor. He's an NBA sports writer. He's a basketball coach. And now he's an author. Uh, he's also worked in the Christian music industry. Uh, we're talking a, a lot about his book, Searching for Seven. It's a devotional, but it's also a, a quick chapter read, depending on your personal preference. Uh, and it's about searching for God every day, and not just on Sundays. Because... Like with God, with any relationship, it's very hard to build and maintain and thrive in a relationship if you only spend an hour a week with them, and sometimes not every week. So it's a great read. It's a great story. Uh, not story. But it's a it's a great book, and it's really quick, and I think it will be really encouraging. So here is our interview with Tyler Smith as we talk about Searching for Seven, which is all about searching for God seven days a week. And you're listening to the Gifts of Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women using their gifts for God's glory. And I'm now joined uh, by Tyler Smith. Tyler Smith, he is an NBA sports writer. He's a pastor. He's a basketball coach and an author. We're going to be talking about his latest work, Searching for Seven, uh, during this interview. Uh, he's also worked in the Christian music industry. 
He graduated from Lincoln Christian University and uh, has served in ministry since 2005. And judging by his uh, profile picture, I would say he started the, in ministry at age 10. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyler re- resides in Indiana with his wife, Caitlin, and their two daughters, Addie and Ellie. Uh, so Tyler Smith, welcome to the Gifts for Glory podcast. How are things going in Indiana? Things are good. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, to talk and uh, join a show like this and love what you're doing. So it's good to be here. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to have you. Uh, so how, how did you manage during uh, the, the crisis as far as like your work? Because I know you're a pastor as well, but I'm sure that uh, that it took a hit on you as well. Yeah, definitely the, the sports related stuff that I do. Um, thankfully, we're out of season for the team that I coach. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot with that, but as far as, uh, you know, NBA and college basketball, um, you know, huge halt to that. And then, you know, just in general, I'm a a big sports fan. So that's a big part of my life. And a lot of the entertainment side of things (laughs) went away, but, um, honestly it was in one way it was, uh, it was okay timing in, in terms of, uh, the book launch and promoting it and, you know, having things to do with that and then getting to spend more time with family was good as well, for sure. Awesome. What do you do as far as uh, pastoring and ministry? Uh, main thing I do is work with the youth group here in Indiana. So I've been doing youth ministry for about 15 years now. And how, how have you seen the the effects of, uh, of the, the crisis uh, impacting youth in, in what you've been doing? Um, yeah, I think so. We did like what a lot of groups did, which a lot of Zoom calls. And, mm-hmm. and then uh, when things opened up, we kind of shifted our schedule and added some more youth groups, you know, in the summer, um, which we normally wouldn't do, but we wanted to give our seniors, you know, a few more youth groups and things. And we did a CIY conference at home instead of going on the trip. Um, so a lot of things there. I mean, I think a lot of people were kind of zoomed out by, uh, you know, maybe two months into it, but we did the best we could. I think our students around here did as best as they could, especially our seniors, um, dealing with, uh, the hand they were dealt and trying to see the good in it. So working with the youth, and uh, many of them had to do remote learn- learning through Zoom or, or Google Meets. Did you see that there? You, you mentioned the term "zoomed out." So did you see a lot of fatigue with the technology aspect of trying to still have fellowship and uh, still pour into them? A little bit, yeah. Because when when they couple almost everything with school youth group, um, <clears throat> some of them were still a bit hang out, hang out with friends. Some, but you know, even some of that was online stuff and and we tried to mix it up the best we could we tried to get creative with uh, different games and different methods of how we were meeting um i think you know my group was i i would say stayed the course for most of it you could just tell you know towards the end i was like man when is this going to end um when can we get back to more normal life but did the best i could yeah it, it's one of those times that it's, it's uncharted territory so there's going to be learning processes and there's going to also be successes that you maybe didn't expect uh did you see any of those uh successes where you were able to see like there was an impact still being made despite the technology yeah you know when i talk about this i always mention that um thus far personally i have not dealt with much of the the loss that so many people have with all this i haven't seen very much, you know, people I know even getting the virus. And so I want to be sensitive to that when I say the other part of it. Uh, But I have, you know, me personally, I have seen a lot of positives from this. Um, A lot of positives at our church and our students, a lot of people that I know that are also in ministry, seeing some of their success stories. Um, A lot of churches have really figured out the online church thing, which Mm -hmm. will help them in the future. That was, you know, one thing that we were able to do. And as I mentioned, this little CIY conference we did, we opened it up to the community instead of just our youth group. So a lot of youth groups came together. Um, we also opened up the ages of it. We did sixth through 12th grade instead of ninth through 12th. Okay. And we actually had um, several sixth graders who would have not gone on the trip, uh, make a decision for Christ in, in uh, wow. that, that little three day conference that we did at home. So you know, there's always those things that if you, you know, can see the positive in a tough situation, um, I've seen quite a bit of it. All right. So we'll get into it a lot heavily uh, later on, but I do want to kind of tease a little bit about the book. Uh, it just came out this spring, I believe, uh, Searching for Seven. Uh, give us the uh, kind of the elevator pitch on what this, what this is geared towards. 
So the number seven has kind of a double meaning. Seven is in scripture. It can be the number of God Mm -hmm. um, means completeness and perfection. So in a way it's, I'm, I'm searching for him, but I'm also searching for my own faith seven days a week. Um, I believe that too many people want to know God and they want him to show up, but they themselves don't really seek him. Mm -hmm. Um, They just want him to show up in burning bushes and lightning, you know, across the sky experiences and I fully believe that God does seek us and pursue us. But like any relationship, there's got to be a two-way street there. I, I've got to look for him. Um, I don't ever want to be that person that says, where is God when maybe my Bible's closed and I'm not paying attention to church and I'm not uh, talking to other Christians about faith. If I'm not doing anything, then not putting action in my faith. And, you know, that's kind of on me. So, um, but the book has, it's a really, it's a quick read short chapters, a lot of stories from my life, uh, with, whether it be in the sports world or just in ministry or fatherhood, all these different things. I tried to write it with like kind of a Bob Goff style mm-hmm. uh, with uh, the, the stories and the scripture that encourages with it. Um, so really it's 19 chapters, but they're all short and they're all different topics, but cohesive in a way of, you know, looking for God all seven days a week. Perfect. All right, uh, before we get into the book, let's hear a little bit more about you and about your journey. Uh, You mentioned in your bio that you uh, came from a Christian home, but really didn't uh, find your faith until, at least not make it your own until college. So uh, walk us through that. How did you find Christ and make uh, Jesus as your Savior? Yeah, I was very fortunate to have such a great Christian family and church and uh, and sister and parents, you know, very strong believers. Um, I think for a while it was just, it was on me growing up to where I was, um, I was known as the Christian kid, which looking back, it just basically meant, well, he goes to church and he doesn't really do anything too terrible. So that's what it means to be a Christian. And I, I went along with that, you know, Christianity was just a part of my life instead of being my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it wasn't until college, actually the year before I went to a Bible college, I went to Indiana state And I know a lot of people go the opposite way. They go to college and they leave church. For me, it was a testing of my faith to where I cling to God. I I felt like he's calling me to something different and, you know, leaning on him. And so then when I transferred to a Bible college, it was the people there that just poured into my life and were going through some of the same things. I learned a lot from the professors and classes, but it was really my teammates, my classmates, the late night dorm room talks about theology and you know, those kind of things that just completely shaped, um, shaped my life and helped me to jumpstart more of a life of a journey of following Christ and not just a belief or, you know, I go to church and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a turning point moment where it it clicked for you or were you more of kind of somebody that was in a crock pot, just kind of simmering until you got done and realized, oh, wow, I'm actually truly believing. Yeah, I like that analogy. Probably more the crockpot scenario. Um, I, if there was one bigger thing, it would be a uh, Bible study group that I joined with some friends before I went to the Bible college. They would actually they would have a Bible study, then they would go out um, to our town and they would actually witness to people. Mm. But they did it. They did it in such a loving. I'm so glad my first experience was in a loving way and not some you know awful experience. But they just talked to people, asked some questions. I wasn't doing any of the talking, but I was doing a lot of listening. And so week after week, that was probably the beginning process of like, man, the things they're saying and the um, discussions they're bringing up and how they're loving all these people. This is, this is real. And I guess that was my beginning in the crockpot scenario. Nice. My wife and I have actually been to uh, Lincoln Christian a few times. We uh, take what's called ISOM, Illinois School of Ministry, which is an AG uh, past world training program. We've been down there a few times and cool. And, and it's, it's a lovely campus and it's secluded, but it's close enough to the things you might want to see. Uh, you're not yeah. too far from Springfield. You're not all too far from Chicago either. Um, so what are some fond memories that uh, helped you during your time there in Lincoln? Definitely the, the sports I played basketball and baseball. Um, and you know, so a lot of travel with that. Um, but also they do these things. They may have a different name for them now, but it was week of E week of evangelism, uh, Hmm. basically mission trips. And I know it's going to sound like I'm really roughing it, but I went to the Bahamas for hurricane relief with the basketball team. Two years later, I went to Maui (laughs) 
uh, my friend's uncle lived there and they have a an, an huge uh, homeless um, population and ministry. We also cleared out some jungles for this lady to put on Christian retreats. So we spent longer so we could do like a little bit of vacation, but it was, I mean, there was a lot of good work there too. Um, but yeah, the week of E trips, the basketball trips, and like you said, you know, we're close to Springfield, Bloomington. We would go to the Sunday night college age service. Mm-hmm. So we'd get a, get a sleep in on Sundays and then go to church Sunday nights. <laughs> That's, that was our plan at that time. Um, and then, yeah, pretty close to Chicago and St. Louis and, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of fun trips. Awesome. Now let's talk about the book, uh, Searching for Seven. We touched on it a little bit earlier. It's kind of got a double meaning, Searching for Seven, because it's the number of God, the number of completeness. And it's also the, the literal meaning of Searching for Seven, meaning Searching for Seven Days a Week. Uh, what inspired the book and, and uh, what, uh, what prompted you to put this to, you know, uh, to uh, a book format? I had the idea to write about four or five years ago. And my thought was, you know, all these years of youth ministry teaching and all my years of sports writing experience, can I combine it? Um, Eventually became one of those things where, okay, this is an offering to God and whoever reads it, it's an offering and hopefully God uses it. And I didn't have a title at first, but as I started to write and compile notes, I was like, you know, most of what I'm saying fits into this category of you know, seven day a week Christian and not just a Sunday only or camp only um, Christian. And so I played, played around with some different titles. And then eventually that, that one came to my mind and it, you know, was not taken by someone else. And like a lot of things kind of fell into place. Um, But yeah, that's how it started. Um, I really wrote the book in 2019, but it was the years leading up that compiled notes and the, the wheels were turning about writing one. Is it set up as a uh, devotional format or is it more of a uh, straight read through? Uh, What would you say is the best way to read the book? I would say it is both. And it's kind of weird to say that, but the publisher says that as well. They put it in three categories. Um, They they actually, which is one reason I went with this particular publisher when they went through it and they had a lot of extensive um, feedback and they said, you know, this book could really be like a little more extensive daily devotion um, it's not like the one page or just a story in question. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it, it's short chapters for a normal read, but for a daily devotion, it's in, you know four, four, six, seven, or eight pages at the most. Um, so when they told me that, I was like, okay, I want to put. I decided to put questions in the back of the book in case a small group or in case uh, you know a daily devotion they can read it and then look at the back at you know maybe four or five um, questions for discussion, but. Obviously, obviously, a lot of people um, that just like to read, um, especially those that like quick reads, you know, just go through it and, and don't do the small group thing or the daily thing. But um, either one, I think it works in multiple categories. And does it combine a lot of scripture or is it more personal story or, or what's the, the content? like? Lots of scripture. Uh, that's, I mean, one of my main focuses was in my life, the scriptures that have come alive the most in those situations i want to kind of set up here's something that happened or here's a thought and then boom this to me it reminds me of this scripture or this scripture at this point in my life did you know spoke to me in in crazy ways and um it's like some of the stories are from a while back back to college or even high school some are more recent in fatherhood but it all it is all with the goal of making the Bible come to life um, more. What was your favorite part about writing the book? Was there something that you discovered, something that challenged you as you wrote this? I think the different coffee shops was my, (laughs) (laughs) actually I had built up some, uh, some vacation time. And um, so last year, 2019, I used a lot of it and I was like, all right, every single day I'm going to find a different coffee shop that I've never been to, to try to, you know, get, get some inspiration. But the process, I know some people, and maybe maybe it's more if they've written multiple books, they have like writer's block and they're kind of stressed. Not not once was I ever like stressed. It was one of the most fun things I've ever done. Maybe partially because of all that build up time of compiling notes and stuff, but it was it was a blast. Um, the only you know sometimes I would say I had ideas for chap- chapters, and I was like, well, this isn't long enough. Well, this one actually you could combine it. So let's make one. Let's change the title and. Um, but all of that to me was, was fun. I know some people stress with it, but 
Um, I liked it a lot. The title of the book is called Searching for Seven, and uh, it's available at searchingforseven.com, uh, Searching for Seven, The Journey of Seeking God Seven Days a Week, which is something that in America, I think, is a message that we need more of. There's a lot of us in the body that that will let our, our Christianity rest on Sunday, and as soon as it's one o'clock hits, we're out the door, we're ready, we think we've got our battery charged for the week, and that's kind of the last thing that we think about you know, throughout the week. Uh, but it is really a challenge, and it really is a journey to get there because it, it is like any relationship. Like you and I are both married, we can't invest one hour or two hours a week into our wives and think that everything's okay. It's yeah. got to be a pursuing relationship each and every day, and on the days that you fall short, you go to bed, get back up, and try again the next day. Yeah, I agree with you that uh, it's a big challenge, and even the churches that I see doing a really good job of trying to stay away from Sunday only, it's still a huge challenge for the congregation to you know, return that because we're just so programmed to be like, all right, Sunday, church, that's the day I hear from God, that's the day I think about God. But yeah, you know, love the marriage analogy and um, just any any kind of relationship that like, okay, I'll see you next week, you know, at, at this time, um, you know, got to be more to it than that. More of the Gifts for Glory podcast in just a second. I really enjoyed this interview and hope you're enjoying listening to this wonderful conversation. We'll return with the second half of our interview in just a moment. I just wanted to step in and share more about Wellverse Comedy, the improv comedy ministry of Gifts for Glory. Wellverse is a clean, family-friendly comedy troupe that performs super fun, always original comedy shows for all ages. We've packed the house at Second City on two occasions, headlined two nights in a row at Gutty's Comedy Club in suburban Indianapolis, plus offered our talents at numerous fundraisers throughout Chicagoland. In this crazy time, we've even taken our talents to great fun virtual shows, which are available for free on our Facebook page. And we'd love to be your solution for entertainment for your next event in the future or for a special online gathering to bring together your family, friends, co-workers, or small group. If you're looking for something special, we'd love to help make your gathering one to remember if for all the right reasons. So if we can help you out, please email improv at wellversecomedy.com, improv at wellversecomedy.com. And more of our interview next, right here on the Gifts for Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women using their gifts for God's glory. You know, love the marriage analogy and um, just any any kind of relationship that, like, okay, I'll see you next week, you know, at, at this time. Um, you know, got to be more to it than that. Have you gotten any feedback yet from people that have read it? And uh, how long has it been out? It came out June 2nd. <clears throat> and uh, it's been really good feedback. Um, a lot of people I know and a lot of people I don't, which is awesome. Um, you know, I, 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 speaking of Bob Goff, I pulled a Bob Goff and put my, my phone number in the back. <laughs> there you go. Uh, which, uh, you know, I, I doubt it's going to be, you know, tens of millions of copies like Bob Goff. His phone just rings off the hook all day long. But I was like, I love that idea because even if somebody is a hater or something, like I just think it's cool to be like, hey, I'm an open book. You know, if you've read it, if you have comments, you know, text me, call me, let's chat, um, have a question about something. So I, I've already been getting some of those like, like, hey, I'm from in this random state. And it's just like mind blowing. Um, one of my goals was to hit all 50 states and we're already about halfway, I think, as far as it being uh, purchased or, or, you know, in one of those states, we're about halfway there and um, got to do podcasts in uh, Kenya and the UK and wow. um, it's wild, but yeah, it's, you know, anything, any chance I get to talk, um, not just about the book, but the topic in general and talk about faith, you know, if people listen to a show and, and, not one book sales, but they got something from the conversation. And that's amazing too. So that's a cool opportunity. For somebody that's listening that, uh, that struggles with keeping God in more than one day a week, what would be the easiest thing? Um, you know, buying the book would be one thing, but what would be the easiest thing that you could advise them or, or tip them off to say, this is how you can get into the habit of seeking for seven? I always tell people that you have to find what works for you. And if you haven't found something yet, then you got to try, <laughs> try different things. 
Um, cause I know for me for so many years of my life, it was just like, I didn't really do anything to see what made me feel closest to God and what made me hear from him. I was just, again, programmed for a church and maybe once in a while, a conference or a concert. But then I realized I've got to take some ownership here. And so what works for me may not work for you, but for me, making sure I'm in God's word, at least a little bit every day. Um, I listen to minimum two Christian podcasts a week. Um, I make sure, especially like some of the concerts are starting to come back like drive-in style, but I try to make sure, you know, at least five, maybe up to 10 times a year, I'm going to a Christian concert and um, listening to Christian music quite a bit otherwise. But another big challenge that I hope people get from this topic is that we need to be people that uh, initiate faith-based conversations more. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not just the go up to a stranger and, Hey, if you die, you know, like that kind of stuff. I mean, like with people that you trust Christians or non-Christians bring up some conversation, like you bring it up, you know, um, I tell our, our, um, student ministry sometimes that, Hey, if we went to a coffee shop and I didn't bring something up about God, would it ever get brought up? Or would all of you just talk about sports and the weather and school and all that? All that's fine. But once in a while, be people that bring it up because I, the most that I've grown in my life is from conversation with people I trust that are Christians. Some of it's challenging my belief. Some of it's questioning. Some of it's like give and take, but that's a big thing too. Like have those conversations, find people you trust, ask them a question, write down questions. Every time you have it about the Bible or a, a topic or current event, go to somebody, talk about it, make it a daily habit. And there you go. You're already more aware of what God is doing on a day to day basis. If you do that. And I think that that's extremely healthy and extremely needed right now because our society, especially during the COVID and being locked down and separated, that we don't have those conversations. It's often said, uh, never talk religion and politics with other people, which I think has become such a detriment because we don't know how to have a conversation with somebody that disagrees with us. If I'm right wing, all of a sudden I know everything about somebody that's, that's left wing and we forget the nuances that makes us unique and also makes us alike. And we get so separated. And the more conversations we have, the more that we can say, we're actually more alike than we are different. Yeah. I think that's so important. Um, so, and our, our youth need to hear that. So I think that's a really awesome place that you're in, encouraging the youth, just have the conversation and do it in love, not necessarily to preach, but also to be able to learn. Yeah. I think that's vital. And a lot of times people are more open to it than you would think, but just ask them, you know, start with the mindset of, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions. I'm not just going to wait and tell you why, you know, I think Timothy Keller was the one that said that, you know, bad evangelism is saying, I'm right, you're wrong, and let me tell you about it. Mm -hmm. But good, good evangelism is, hey, um, what do you believe about God? Why, how'd, you get to, how'd you get to that place? And he also says, tell me your view of God. I may not believe in that God either. Your view of God, I may not believe in that God either. I may have a different view. So it just like the question opens up conversation. And the Bible is all about relationship. Uh, everything, everything that happens, all the good stories, all the, the amazing stories is built on relationship. Sure, there's preaching like the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but the really big changes, the life transformation is built on relationship. The iron sharpening iron, working together. And I think that we in America especially are missing that out so much. Because we, we, even in the church, we've allowed politics to become such a divisive force that yeah. it, it's hard for us to talk about politics and religion because we want to be, we're focused on being right and not righteous, I think. Yeah. Yeah, one of the chapters in my book is called Choose the Right Battles, and I definitely get into politics and uh, even problems in the church. A lot mm -hmm. of times uh, problems in the church is when I care about my opinion or my view more than a person instead of coming together. And largely, I'm not speaking for all Christians, but largely we've been pretty bad at choosing which battles are worth fighting for. And, and even if you, you know, again, disagree with something, then disagree in love and figure out how to talk about it. It's a good way to go. And one of the things that I've been convicted of lately that I've tried to push, especially when I talk to, or I share things in uh, ministers groups is I try to, Say that 
in 10,000 years, it's not going to matter who we voted for. What's going to matter is how we treated the people that we disagreed with. Yeah. That's going to be what's important. That's what God's going to look at. He's not going to care if you vote for the Democrats, Republicans, the birthday party, or the Libertarian <laughs> Party, whatever it may be. That's not going to matter. What's going to matter is how you treated the people that God put in your life. And I think mm-hmm. uh, the more conversations we have and the more times we truly spend searching for seven, as your book is uh, so amazingly titled, as we continue searching mm-hmm. for seven, we're going to find all the answers we need, and we're also going to know <clears throat> when not to speak. And I think that is another skill that that we struggle with is knowing when to take the Miranda rights and have the right to remain silent. Yes. Yes, I like that. So what I do, and I didn't warn you ahead of time, because I'd like to throw this as a surprise to my first time guest, is I do something called the interrogation. And it's seven quick questions. Uh, they're kind of random. And it's just a kind of way to get to know you a little bit better about things that maybe were not pertinent to our conversation. Sure. Much of your life is, is uh, been around uh, basketball. So my first question is going to be, what's the best basketball film that you've seen? I'm going to sound biased, but Hoosiers, even though I, I feel like I would, it's hard to say, but I feel like even if I didn't live in Indiana, that would at least be up there because of just the storyline, you know, small school going up against big schools before class and just being a basketball fan. It's, it's a good one. I can argue against that one. That's a, a great film. Um, so question number two, uh, in your coverage of the NBA um, as NBA sports writer, uh, what interview uh, has made you either the most nervous or the most fanboy? <laughs> um, probably a recent one. Well, I mean, when I first started in 2014, those first couple were like, I mean, I asked uh, Paul George a question after a playoff game. It was live on NBA TV, and you could just hear me going, uh, Paul. Uh. So I was pretty nervous because it was my first like first experience. But believe it or not, this past November. Uh, I interviewed Vince Carter and it was his last trip to Indiana. Um, I lucked out because they had a back to back and they were leaving pretty quickly. So usually there's a lot of media if a guy's last game, but there was nobody in there. I just wanted to get a picture, but I went up to him and I, and I was like, I could tell he was in a hurry, but I was like, it was just, I mean, it was only like a minute long, but I got to tell him like, Hey, we here in Indiana, we love basketball. And, I remember as a kid growing up, we would pretend to be Reggie Miller and we would pretend to be you. We would shoot threes like Reggie. We would dunk like Vince Carter. And uh, just to be able to tell him that, it was really cool. Nice. Question number three, what's the hardest thing you experienced during the COVID crisis and, and the lockdowns? Hardest thing, which again is I'm insanely lucky that I haven't really even known really anybody to have it around where I am. Um, so, you know, it would be more of a, um, uh, more of a, I guess, boredom from not having sports. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I will say it, at least I'm in my defense. It's not just that I miss watching them cause it is, you know, part of what I do as well for work. Um, but the, the timing of it, you know, like I had just tweeted that, you know, March is the greatest sports month. We got March madness. We got, baseball starting we got uh nba the playoffs are coming and then nothing nothing happened but (laughs) i feel a little guilty saying it but that was that was my biggest thing probably gotcha looking back what's uh your biggest regret in life or the one thing you most like to do over Mm. biggest regret um i know a lot of people will say this actually just was watching a a documentary from like the band one Republic and Ryan Tedder said this exact thing. He was like, I know everybody really says this, but different confidence in high school. Like if I have, if I am who I was now in high school, so many more things could have happened, but I'll, I'll take it a step further and say from a faith standpoint, really regret um, not really reaching people doing much of anything faith related that's one reason I got into youth ministry to try to help um, other kids. And now I, I get a chance to talk to a lot of my old high school friends about God these days. And you know, some uh, even from the book that came out. Um, but um, yeah, I would say, say that's the big thing is not um, putting action in my faith when I had that chance. Hmm. 
Our next question is going to be, you just mentioned your interview with uh, Vince Carter, and you said that uh, growing up, you either shot threes like Reggie or dunked like Vince. So based on those two comparisons, who were you most like as a ball player, Vince or Reggie? (laughs) Most like uh, Reggie. I never could dunk. Um, I actually, there's another pacer, his name's Jermaine O'Neal that for a while I kind of modeled my game after, even though um, I'm like six, four, but it's still pretty undersized and, you know, for college ball. So, but we didn't have a ton of height on our team. So I would be playing a lot of teams, you know, six, seven, six, eight, six, nine. So I, I learned a lot of like up and under fake and hook shots and stuff like that. So I'd say closer to Reggie, but Jermaine O'Neal overall. Nice. This one's more of a serious question. What keeps you up at night? Kids. (laughs) Kids. <laughs> uh, yeah, if my, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old, so sometimes they keep me up. Um, but as far as uh, other things, um, I think a while back there would be some ministry-related things that would get at me and bother me. Um, maybe something that somebody didn't get or a comment. Um, and again, you, you know, could have – a hundred good comments, but the one bad one, you just kind of eats at you. Um, those things don't bother me as much as they used to. So I'd say maybe I lost some sleep a while back early on in ministry mm-hmm. for some of those things. Um, now maybe in, in basketball season, we have a big County game or something the next night I might be hard to sleep. Cause I'm thinking about what can we do? You know, what, what should we do in this game? And so, uh, <laughs> All right. And the final question is, um, going back to uh, searching for seven, was there anything that you found that God worked on you as you wrote the book? Was there a big revelation during the course of writing, whether it's through the notes that you compiled or the actual writing? I think a big thing is just um, the, the challenge I would give myself. Um, I tell people this a lot, but one of my heroes is uh, John Foreman. He's a lead singer of Switchfoot. Mm. Uh, one time he said that, you know, if I'm going to sing it, I got to live it. And so my, my challenge is even as writing it is like, oh man, I need to, <laughs> <laughs> I, if I'm writing this, I need to live it in every aspect. There's going to be people that have read it that are watching. And, you know, I, I mean, maybe a few of the chapters, um, you know, certain topics that would be like, this is going to be, it's going to be a challenge, but if I'm saying it, I need to live it. So it was a kind of a personal conviction type thing. Almost like you've written your own accountability partner. Yeah. Which I think a lot of people, if they journal and stuff, they could absolutely hold themselves accountable. What did I write? And am I living it out? Nice. Very good. Well, that was the interrogations. Uh, so appreciate you participating in that. And the final question on every interview I ask is, uh, for anybody out there that's wanting to either discover or step into using their gifts for God's glory, what would be your wise counsel for that person? I think I always refer, well, there's a couple of places in scripture that I always refer to, but one of them is in Ephesians where it says we are uh, Christ's uh, work, handiwork. Um, we are created in Christ to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Um, the analogy I give is like, I have this scooter in my shed at my house that I like to ride sometimes, but if I don't ride it very often, it stops working. Mm. And uh, you can think of anything in your house, like maybe the lawnmower over the winter or something, hard to fire it back up because it's not meant to just sit there. Mm-hmm. Well, we we in our faith are not meant to just sit there. We're not meant to sit in the shed. Um, we are created to serve. We're created to do good works. So if we're not doing those things, then we're going to rot. We're going to not feel like our life has value, purpose, and meaning. There's a lot of um, opportunities that we may miss because we're just kind of sitting back and, and not, you know, putting action to it. Uh, now, I also think of uh, Parable of the Talents, whether you have the five talents or the two, both of them put it to use and they both got the same reward. So it's, I think it's teaching us that whatever you've been given, use it. Um, I try to tell people that, what are you passionate about? Okay. Make that a ministry somehow. What are you good at? What do you like doing? What makes you feel most alive? Figure out how to do that thing 
to enjoy God, to worship, but also I can reach somebody with basketball or writing or singing or artwork, building, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is, use it for ministry somehow. Awesome. Well, Tyler Smith, thank you so much for joining us again. The uh, name of the book is Searching for Seven, The Journey of Seeking God Seven Days a Week. You can find uh, the book and how to purchase it at searchingforseven.com. There's also a link to DVD resources. Uh, you can find out more about Tyler and his different ministries. And uh, you can find the links to his Facebook and his Twitter and Instagram, all that at searchingforseven.com. Tyler, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, here on the Gifts Warrior Podcast. Thanks for having me.